Okay, I have a theme for this reading. It's going to be riffs on great poets and poems, variations, improvisations, updates, revisions. Uh, we're going to start with the New Testament, with the story of the woman who was being stoned for possibly being an adulteress or being a prostitute. Some scholars claim this woman named Mary is Mary Magdalene, so this is a revisionist version of this biblical tale. Mary Magdalene and the Stoners. Mary did not wear a robe. They saw her dress, her ankle curve. She touched a nerve, an eyeball swerve. The men confessed, they were stressed. They were distressed, they confessed, by her swerve, her ankle curve, her tilt of breast, the lilt of dress. They could not rest in their distress. They dragged Mary to the green, wanted all to see, be seen. Their gaze was keen, strip her clean, she must confess. The men were stressed. The men of stone, eyes of bone, picked up stone, cold as moan. Mary saw the wife of Bath spitting back the grapes of wrath. She told the stones they were unblessed, they should swallow their distress. She demanded word of bone, who was pure in world of stone? The stones amazed, bowed to bless Mary in her silken dress. The men confessed, they were stressed, touched her palm. Holy bomb. Now, one of the most, maybe the most famous poem to come out of World War I is In Flanders Fields. Incredibly enough, John McCrae wrote this poem in 1915, and it is a pro-war poem. The dying soldiers hand their weapons off to the recruits to continue the battle. So I wrote a variation called In Flanders Field, a variation. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow to fields that we will never know. We are the dead. Short days ago, we felt the dawn, the sunset glow. Our leaders ordered us to go to places we will never know. Who is friend? Who is foe? The field of char is all we know. Worms crawl through the skull of light. Locks swirl up in harried flight. They can neither sing nor pray for faces melted into clay. See the circling of crow who wonder at the fields below of flies who buzz and only know the stench of food the breezes blow. In Flanders field the poppies grow, but flee to fields that never know. The flies that buzz the circling crow, who is friend, who is foe? <laughs> Alexander Pope wrote poems in the 18th century exposing the foibles and the follies and the horrors of that age. And this is a 21st century version of an Alexander Pope type poem called Bloom and Strut. And it's a toast, so it's, this is a perfect uh, place for this poem. Bloom and Strut. A toast to those who bloom and strut, to those tethered to pose and pretense, dangling from the marquee of their zip code, to the magnet lucrative and balmy load. A toast to the power, blokers, opinion bakers, the opaque, stokers of whiz-bang, the jockeying, the take. To the rulers of the gilded precincts, to the mythologies of buster and luster. Raise your cup to those that strut down and up the non party scenes, who lean on those who question their credentials, and puff the next fashionista bleeding into smugness. Here's to the bloomers and blasters pasted across the networks of seam, to the ballyhoo of the redeemed and reinvention, to the stutterers at the next convention. A toast to strutters, to hooters, to you, to no one, to every man who is any man who is the one, who is anyhow, by the way, swing and sway, to the bloomers, the rumors, and another day.
Diane and I went down to the Carolinas in April to see the blooming of the trees and flowers, except most of the trees are dying in Arkansas, North Carolina, and Virginia. This is a, a William Blake type poem to the dying of the trees. It's called In the Forest of Dying Trees. In the forest of dying trees, ask the skies, ask the leaves, Ask the worm curling white, sipping on the blood of spite. Sucking white from moon of bone, till the moon must atone for ashen craters born of need, sipping on the stone of greed. Ask the fly, ask the mite, if the leaves can, can find the lord of light. Ask the river to atone for springs that turned the moon to bone. Ask the bee buzzing black why the field is on the rack, why the sun is folded back, why the trees are buzzing black. In the forest of dying trees, ask the skies, ask the leaves. This is another William Blake type poem called Why Do Sparrows Sing? Why do sparrows sing at dawn? Do they see past seas forlorn? Do they hear the sun's accord reflected in the face of Lord? When they see a slice of moon, do they hear an ashen tune dangling on a frail cord, listening to the word of Lord? When all is seen, all is sown, do they see a moon of bone, a vial of blood slowly poured down the jagged cheek of Lord? Does the sun Rise in crest, lift a song from sparrow's breast, rising in the force of cord, blazing with the flame of Lord. Now, in 1863, Emily Dickinson wrote a fantastic poem called My Life Had Stood a Loaded Gun. It was written during the Civil War, and it's a love poem from the rifle, the rifle is a persona in the poem, expressing its love for the hunter or for the soldier. So I took this idea and attributed it to a predator drone singing its love for the, its master, the guy in the cubicle who, who uh, 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 arranges for its movements from Virginia or Denver over Afghanistan or Iraq. This is called The Predator Speaks. A thousand fingers sodded fine, the bits within my brain. My master sings his tune of sight, my wires taught refrain. We survey the valley wide, the ways of rocks and man. Man and woman come and go in vectors of my scan. My master's voice, I must obey, his vision born of sigh. His tender palm upon my clutch, I cannot but reply. His fingers touch my quivering keys. My screen alights his eye. I embrace his power to know. His truth becomes my lie. Wow. This is another Emily Dickinson poem. This is about the sky. Now, ancient people see the sky as a mysterious, majestic thing. Most people today are looking down on their tablets, so they have no time to look up at the sky. Now, this is for Emily Dickinson. She wrote many poems about the sky. The sky that is, the sky that was, what Emily saw for Emily Dickinson. The sky that is, we see as dust. What drifts beyond, we see as must. The force of light, the force of dark, the contingent flame, the chance of spark. The stars that drift, the exhausted sun that splits in two returns to one. The moon that turns an iron course and pulls the sea with iron force. The sky that was what Emily saw, the sky that was beyond before. Before the name of sky was said beyond the valley of the dead, a pyramid is what Emily saw, a sphinx that flew beyond before. She saw a sequel, a circle beyond, invisible as music, but positive as sound. I just have two more poems. This one is about Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who just passed away this year. And these, the images in this poem come from his works, Autumn of the Patriarchs, 100 Years of Solitude, Leaf Storm, and his poetry. It's in memoriam for Gabriel Garcia Marquez. 
The scent of jasmine in the garden was a silent ghost. He, Gabriel, walked with him, he talked with him. Was this the Lord of hosts? He saw the drought, the killing flood, the plague of locusts cross the skies, a rocking chair floating in the mud, a skull graced with Lord of flies. His father painted his workshop white so the child could paint his tears. He saw a fountain filled with blood so the child would paint his prayers. Plagues of insomnia, a cluster of grapes containing the secret of death, an all-night rain of yellow blossoms containing the secret of breath. He saw cattle branded by man splayed across the sky. He saw the chain, the rusted can, the rotted flute, fruit dining with the fly. In the end, he returned to the garden with jasmine in the air. He walked with the ghost, the Holy Ghost, and offered him one tear. This is my last poem. It's going to be a tribute to Allen Ginsberg. Now, Allen Ginsberg, in the summer of, no, the spring of 1980, had a very wild, raunchy time in Naropa, in Colorado, uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And he wrote a poem about it. It's a sapphic poem in the form that uh, Sappho wrote uh, on the Isle of Lesbos to her lovers. And he wrote this to his lovers. Now, it's a very raunchy poem. And his mother got very upset by it. So he, she wrote a poem back to Alan, from the grave, of course, because she was dead. So this is a sapphic poem by Alan Ginsberg's mother, written from the grave to Alan in Boulder, Colorado, May 29, 1980. Ay, Gavalt, Alan, what makes you different from the others? Driving me sugar to the crazy house for mothers. I've got this Jewish nice girl, makes good soup. Remember that girl, Rebecca, you used to schmooze with on the shul steps after Sabbath service? Oh, I don't like that word. As they say, may, as they say, matzo ball soup, good for you. Help cure that cold you got from cold Colorado nights. What were you doing dancing Naropa, a barefoot wild kid crazy? You knew him and came? I never heard such language from you before. When you were going to Hebrew school, you got good grades. Oh, you're so nice in your bar mitzvah suit. <laughs> Maybe matzo balls Rebecca makes make you forget those other balls you're so crazy about. <laughs> I never should have let you go to Columbia. So far, you met crazy boys. Jack Kerouac and William Burroughs and Gregory Corso and that Neil Cassidy. He was the one, that Neil, make you most crazy. You think boys are girls. How do you make babies? You come in behind? That's Meshuggah, Meshagas. I remember, you were a good boy. You said Kaddish for me. Rebecca, she's waiting on the shul steps. Come home, Alan, she's nice. 